joining me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone here to the meeting this morning. It's hard to be inside on a beautiful day like today outside. It's uh, woke up this morning, went outside, and it was just crisp and clean and beautiful. So, do uh, we have a casualty line of duty report, Commissioner Boyce? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes. The last report I actually was able to give the board was about a month ago. So we're 61 now for 2019. The total deaths were 100. Line of duty deaths were 146. Honor the fallen, the military deaths up to 16. Fire administration, quite a, quite a number there, up to 32. Uh, and in 2020, that number uh, was close to 80, if I recall. So Blue Lives Matter moment of silence, Mr. Chair, if we may. from the board on some clarifications, if I may. Uh, on, uh, on my April 14th press release I sent out, uh, inadvertent number, total number of U.S. deaths has doubled in the last 14 days, not 48 hours. I want the public to know that was a mistake. To more than 55,000 lives lost now at this time, 70,000 deaths. Uh, today's agenda, item 7H, uh, I inadvertently left out one word. Uh, that could be confusing to the public, and I apologize for that. The road fund reserves for mask inadvertently left out, falsely discredited when it comes to uh, Josh Richards and Doss Stout. And, uh, by the way, Ms. Smelzer did a good job. A subsequent meeting apologizing for any confusion that might have in, some, in any way painted them in a bad, bad way. Um, so I've asked them to remain available if needed. More on that later. And the last one, I uh, sent a four page letter to emergency management coordinator uh, Dumeyer on April 6th. I won't be changing the content, but I did have some dates wrong correct, and I'll be giving that to the board with uh, make sure those dates are all correct and make that apology. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Do we have any amendments to the agenda? Ms. Schmelzer? Okay. Um, I would just like to add seven I um, discussing the campgrounds. So campgrounds to open. And then 7J, petition governor for phase one approval. So H, you had H is? Um, H is already on the agenda. That's revisiting the, using the road funds to purchase pp &E. So I would create okay, I. There must be something else on my head. This must be, you guys must, somebody must have changed this. Okay, it's the last one. I new this morning. Uh, yeah, it's not a problem. Time. I'll get to it here. Let's see. It, it right. might help, Mr. Chair, if I give my agenda uh, amendment offer. Right, just let me catch up here. I'm on H. So I is uh, campgrounds. J is uh, petition governor. Petition the governor. Okay, Commissioner Boyce. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to poll item 7H. Now, this was submitted last Friday. There's been, as you know, with the whole COVID-19 issue, there are changes every hour, every day. And, um, you know, the state and the federal government continually remind us to be on the lookout for additional PD supplies. And a lot of changes in the last few days of working with Southern Oregon Workers Investment Board uh, to find some non-medical masks for our workers as we reopen is in agreement that that would be a good idea to recommend to our workers. So I'm going to at least um, table that to another meeting uh, because we are, the state is doing better. Uh, we're just with a better international supply. That might change, but it, as of right now, I don't think we need to pursue this. I'm very happy. Uh, and uh, the, the Richards Stout 
team uh, is now the number one supplier in Oregon, and that makes Curry County very proud. And so they'll remain available if we uh, if we need mass down the road. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. <clears throat> All right. Any other amendments to the agenda? I have none. Uh, Council. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On exec session item 11, I'd like to add one, one more, which is 192-660-2H and 2K, which is uh, matters not subject to disclosure, as well as uh, pending litigation. Okay, anything further? I move that we approve the agenda as amended. I'll second Chair Pash. Further discussion? Roll, please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. Right, next, we're going to have our public comments. Um, Mr. Melzer, would you do me a favor and move those mics down? Ms. Rowe has a problem with her vision. We could. Yeah. For Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, you're first. Thank you. I'm Mary Rowe. There are only two places for homeless people to shower in our county, which puts them at an increased risk of catching contagious diseases, as well as those whom they have contact with. One of the groups that homeless people come into very close contact with is our older residents who are in fragile health some of whom must ride the public transit within very close proximity of homeless people. Homeless people and older people who can no longer drive are two of the main groups who ride our public transit. Often, there is even physical contact when people get on and off the bus. This occurs in spite of CPT's efforts to make the ride safe, mostly because of the small space. So, if we care about people who are homeless, and others whom they come into contact with, including some who are most at risk. We must provide hygiene opportunities for homeless people during this time. For years, some of us have worked to acquire a shower trailer for the homeless, as well as for people who are in other emergencies, such as forest fires. Infectious diseases such as typhus, hepatitis A, shigella, and strep are increasingly becoming a problem in nearby communities and is part of the reason why acquiring a hygiene opportunity tool such as a shower trailer should be considered. I believe that our county could purchase a shower trailer and be reimbursed with emergency funds and that we need to take that chance. Commissioner Boyce, you have previously shown great interest in the possibility of a shower trailer and in the welfare of our homeless population. I am asking you if this issue could be put on the next BOC meeting agenda. There is so much information I could give you, and I hope that you will allow me to speak for five minutes if it is on the agenda, as well as Beth Barker Hidalgo, Connie Hunter, Jim Johnson, Sherry Ward, Summer Madison, and Jeremy Dumeyer. I would need to appear by speakerphone per an ADA request. Thank you. Ms. Rowe, could you give all those names again, please? I think I got them all. But... Okay. Let's see here. Um, Beth Barker Hidalgo, of course, Connie Hunter, our veterans advocate, Jim Johnson, who like myself has spent years doing street outreach to homeless people, Cherie Ward, um, I'm hoping the shower trailer might be able to go under public health, Summer Madison, who has worked on the shower trailer during the Chetco Bar fire, and Jeremy DeMeyer, of course. I will put that on, gladly put that on the agenda. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, much, Commissioner Boyce. Thank you. If I can just make a comment on that. Sure. Uh, we did try and get a shower trailer um, a couple of years ago, and we're, we were not successful on that. But in the past month, just so you know, I did reach out to a funder to try and get a shower trailer again, and they chose not to fund it. But it is something that we have continued to work on over the years. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> Carla, good morning. Good morning. Before I say anything, I just want to thank you guys for saluting the flag. It felt great. Um, I've been here for the last three weeks, and 
it took me back to being a little kid in school, and I'm just so <laughs> grateful that you salute the flag to start your meetings. Um, my name is Carla Fultz, and I am a owner of a vacation rental in the county. And I am here just asking once again to please open up the county. Um, I particularly have the highest standards of cleaning at my home, wonderful cleaners that are all out of work. And um, for the last seven weeks, um, I know that there are other vacation rentals that are still renting, but my particular cleaners have tremendous integrity and would not do anything to go against the ordinance for the county. And I'm just asking that you please consider doing that even as soon as today, if that's what's going to happen. Um, we have our particular house. I know you can't pick them apart or whatever, but we have eight oversized sliders that can be opened up for ventilation. We are using hospital grade disinfectants on everything. We did this before, we'll do it now, and we will continue to do it. I take this super serious. So anyway, I just ask that you please open up the county transient lodging because it's killing us. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Connie Hunter. Good morning, Ms. Hunter. Good morning. I'm Connie Hunter, and I'm a proud citizen of South Curry County. It's been a long time since I've been visiting you because I was staying at home, sheltering in place. You look like a ninja warrior. I am. Didn't you know that? It just came out, you We're know, in, in, in this uh, situation. You're using up my time, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I miss you all terribly. Mm -hmm. um, because it's Mental Health Month, and um, I've been a passionate advocate about the importance of mental health in this crisis for, for many years. Now, Gordon doesn't like it when I tell this story over and over again. Um, he's our chair for the Suicide Awareness and Prevention Council, but I'm going to do it anyway uh, because it's good for my mental health. Uh, back in Arizona, when Arizona funded less for mental health than every other state in the union, even less in Puerto Rico, I was working for the development side of the largest community mental health center in Arizona for a Korean War Army veteran. He was my boss. and. He had the foresight and the decision to choose a board chair who was an attorney. And on behalf of individuals, uh, our little organization sued the state of Arizona. And some of those individuals were veterans, so we knew if the VA didn't perform ultimately that uh, the responsibility for mental health for veterans falls back on the state. And that's a premise with which I talked to uh, Alex Campbell many times. Um, when we suffer down here and we don't have all the behavioral health services and the mental health services that we need, and we have to go uh, play hardcore with our VA catchment area director, it's not easy. And none of this work is easy, but it's right. It's the right thing to do. Um, this board of commissioners has by far, and Julie, you're a big piece of this puzzle, supported mental health more than any other board. When I first talked about veteran suicide in this county a number of years ago, I came about three times in a row because it wasn't being recognized. And it was after the fact that our former county VSO had himself committed suicide, taken his life. So, um, when I talked about veteran suicide, literally I had a county commissioner leave the room in the middle of what I was saying and said, everybody knows somebody in Curry County that's a veteran that's committed suicide. Well, that's not standing. And when Oregon got <clears throat> ranked 51 out of 51 for low behavioral health funding, I spoke directly to the governor. When, <clears throat> when we did our Checo Bar fire uh, opportunity at the food bank, and the governor came to thank those food bank uh, volunteers. I spoke to her directly. Don't make me sue the state of Oregon for neglect over our behavioral health system. And the bottom line is, without the support of law enforcement, who does a great job interacting these days, uh, and I know on South County that they've done a little less uh, 
hard stuff on uh, the homeless. And so that's really important to me. But if I was going to sum it up in one sentence, if it wasn't for mental health support, I wouldn't be here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. Thank you. Ms. Boniface. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning, Commissioners. I realized last week I forgot to announce myself. I'm Lynn Boniface, Pistol River. Um, I don't have any notes today. Um, I came here mainly to talk about the transient lodging issue. Um, I would agree with you. We need to open it up. And my kudos go out to Gold Be the Gold Beach City Council for doing just that here in the city of Gold Beach. Um, I am hoping that the county follows suit. Uh, James Kirk made a really good point last week when he said that all we are doing, all of this mitigation, all we are doing is delaying the inevitable. This is a virus. The virus is going to continue to be here. The virus is probably going to be with us forever. It's going to mutate. It's going to change. Just like the flu, the vaccines aren't going to keep up with it. Yes, it's more contagious, but it's a virus. And by doing all of these closings and people out of work and um, the mental health issue is a big issue, we need to get this county back open. And transit lodging is a part of that that you can do today. So I would encourage you to reverse that previous closure. Um, also, I would encourage the um, Board of Commissioners to stand up to Governor Brown. Governor Brown is treating the whole state of Oregon as if we were Portland. And I really would encourage you to push back. Start pushing back. Um, in the letter that, we're, that you're going to talk about today to you know, go through phase one or what, whatever, please make it very strong. We need to get this county open. Um, I've heard people that have, if you will, called the snitch line, the governor's snitch line, and some business, uh, businesses in Brookings have been visited by the Oregon State Police. And my comment to that would be, um, you know, if you have a problem with a business, someone in, uh, who owns a business trying to make a living, don't patronize the business. Just don't go. If you're afraid of catching the virus, don't go. But don't don't fault someone for trying to pay their bills, trying to put food on the table. Someone may have five kids they're trying to feed. You don't know. So I would, I just really would strongly encourage the board as a board to start pushing back harder on Governor Brown. Let's get these businesses open. Let's get the transient lodging open. Let's get the other businesses open. Barbershops, barber salons, et cetera, et cetera. These people need to go to work. And um, the second thing, uh, Commissioner Boyce, you said something this morning. I wanted to just say briefly about masks. There's been talk going around about the county, the cities requiring masks. This is the United States of America. This is not China. This is not Japan. We, as individuals, are responsible for our own health care and our own health. You know, I really would hate to see this county commission vote in something saying that I have to wear a mask. That's just very much an infringement on my rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lynn, if I may. Um, two things. Do we have any verification? Maybe the sheriff's here. He might be able to shed some light on it. The state police visiting businesses in Brookings. I've not heard that, so that's yeah. incredible. I have heard that uh, Fe yeah, Feather My Nest was one, and I don't know what, who the other one was. I've heard there's two businesses as well. Yeah. So, yes. Sheriff, you've not heard that? Said she wasn't going to do that. I've heard it on social media, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> but not not the state police that I have heard that. Uh, I've heard that the governor sent some letters or something down to admonish them for violating. But I, I, I haven't heard about the state police. Thank you, Sheriff. Let me just say one thing about state police. I was listening in on a meeting yesterday with the governor, and the question was asked, are you going to send out the state police if someone is not obeying your order? And she said, no, I will not be doing that. 
police. I don't. Did you hear I the same I thing? I didn't hear about the state police. Okay. I doubt that it was the state police. It was probably just uh, somebody from OLCC, maybe, or uh, that. I don't think they're doing a lot of enforcement other than just saying, hey, you know, we need to bring you back in line. Commissioner Boyce? Thank you again. Lynn, you, you don't need to respond. You can certainly if you want. As far as the mask go, I would never make that a requirement. But I think it is an opportunity to bring the county together because there are so many people who believe that is <coughs> also an opportunity to stop the spread. And if it makes them feel better, and if there is some data that we have not discovered yet regarding this disease, <coughs> then we're okay to take that precaution. I, I, I'm going to recommend to the Board of Commissioners and the three city councils that we request the, ma the, the mask as an option, but not a requirement. And that's on a, be on the screen here later on. Thank you. Okay, that that is great. You know, people can wear masks, people can stay at home, whatever they want to do. I have no issues with that. The only issue I would have if it was made mandatory. You know, a business can do whatever a business wants to do. That's their individual right as a business. But Thank you for re referencing the responsibility that we all have. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on me to take care of my health. And if I think I'm going to get sick from one of you, I'm either going to stay home or I'm going to wear a mask. I also wanted to point out, if I could, that some people can't wear masks. I, I can't even go into a church where they're doing incense because it affects my breathing. So if I'm breathing in my own CO2 all the time and, and all the stuff I make inhaling, it's not good for me medically. And I think a lot of people have that issue as well. So that's just another thing I wanted to bring up. But thank you. Sometimes it's not very pleasant to smell your own breath. Okay. <laughs> that might be a point too. All right. Next, we are going to move on to um, five presentations. Curry Homeless Co Coalition, Beth Bar Barker Hildago. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Beth Barker Hidalgo, Director of the Curry Homeless Coalition. Um, sure. I have packets for all of you. Um, our draft plan infectious disease control plan for the uh, Southern Oregon Coast Resource Center and how we will operate out in the community. And I've also included a framework for COVID-19 homelessness response, responding to the intersecting crisis of homelessness and COVID-19. This is published by the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, we will follow this framework as we continue to develop this plan and figure out what works, what doesn't work here in Curry County, realizing this is a national framework and we need to make some adjustments, most likely, um, for practicality and, and to be able to implement here in Curry County. Um, so I want to thank you for this time to update you on what the Curry Homeless Coalition is doing to prevent the spread of COVID-19 amongst the population. Um, to say we're all facing unprecedented times during this public health emergency seems trite at this point. Um, Curry County struggles with access to health care on a normal day. And I've heard it said several times during COVID-19 that now normal is just a setting on your dryer. We won't know what our normal is going to look like moving forward post-COVID-19. Um, we'll figure that out as we, as we navigate this. Um, but I think that statement is more truth than fiction now than ever. Um, to address the needs of our whole community requires collaborative collaboration and coordination. The Curry Homeless Coalition has reached out to our partners, Coast Community Health, St. Tim's, Beyond Rejection Ministries, and all food pantries in Curry County. We've participated on weekly collaborator calls addressing food insecurity and access to medicine for high-risk, vulnerable members of our population. As a result of this collaboration, service has been developed and implemented to serve our most vulnerable community members. I'd really like to call out Coastline Neighbors for their leadership in crisis. Um, Coastline Neighbors has risen to the occasion in critical ways we would be wise to replicate during future emergencies. The coalition has been operating during COVID-19. The Resource Center has remained open, although very, very limited in services and not allowing access into um, the office space. Um, some of the steps we've taken to respond has been, as of yesterday, we've screened 32 
people for temperature and overall wellness status. Um, we've had one call, client call the triage line at Prairie General Hospital with some advocacy on our part. The client was instructed to go to the ER for a test. Thankfully, the client tested negative. Um, we have secured non-congregate shelter for people, advice to self-isolate. And we are partnering with ORCA to refer clients for intakes. ORCA has secured funding from Oregon Housing and Community Services to support self-isolation in non-congregate shelter at Jots Resort. Um, the coalition was contact contacted just this week by the Curry County Sheriff's Department for and probation um, to determine if self-isolation <coughs> shelter options are available. We shared our contact with Jots, um, with Dave Denny, should there be a need. Um, with Shutter Creek blowing up, if you will, um, there's always a potential we could have a release into Curry County that has either been exposed or tested positive, and so I'm happy that we have an option to self-isolate folks, if need be, that are coming out of the criminal justice system. Um, we have provided visual aids throughout the building. We've got duct tape on the floor, reminding people to stay six feet apart. We have pictures on the wall, pictograms, if you will, demonstrating six foot distancing um, in preparation for full on, for us to be able to reopen again and go back to what our normal was prior to COVID-19. Um, we are providing showers and I'd like to make a correction on Ms. Rose's statement about the access points to showers in Curry County. There are actually three locations, one in each community. Post Community Health in Port Orchard offers showers to our homeless population. We offer showers here in Go Beach and St. Timothy's in South County offers showers. So there are three fixed locations for showers. I feel that the shower trailer would be a nice amenity for emergency management to have in their toolbox for any future disasters that we have in Curry County because we may be serving, I mean, it's not just about, we can have a lot more homeless people post subduction zone earthquake, for example, um, and a greater need for hygiene amongst the population. So it's a consideration under the emergency management um, toolbox whether or not a shower trailer would be beneficial in Curry. But right now, I just wanted you all to know that there are there's access to showers in all three cities within the county right now today. Um, we started that's why we started screening clients was so that we could feel comfortable <laughs> allowing them in. They come in the back door, they go directly in the shower, and then they exit the back door. Um, so. I'd like to close with this thought. During this public health emergency, I've heard many people say <coughs> we're all in the same boat. I'd like to respond by, to this by saying some of us have dinghies and some of us have yachts. And more still have no personal flotation devices whatsoever. As we plan for our community's well-being, we need to do so in a way that provides personal flotation devices as well as repair mechanisms to keep our dinghies and yachts afloat during times of crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. A, business minutes for business meeting March 18th, 2020. B, minutes emergency meeting March 19th, 2020. <clears throat> C, minutes emergency meeting March 23rd, 2020. D, minutes business meeting March 25th, 2020. E, minutes emergency meeting March 27th, 2020. F, minutes business meeting April 1st, 2020. G, minutes special meeting April 8th, 2020. H, minutes special meeting April 20th, 2020. I, bid award annual road paint stripping project with signature authority to Roadmaster. I, or I'm sorry, J, Challenge cost share agreement with USDA for field-based aquatic safety. Signature authority of the Director of Operations. And K, revised rate for newspapers of record. Do I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. So, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Roll, please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. 
Motion carried unanimously. Ms. Hunter? When I submitted my public comments uh, request, I also asked to speak on agenda item five and seven, sir. Sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Okay, I am so sorry to interrupt and, and to ask for this opportunity again. Um, I wanted to make sure that um, I spoke about the Curry Homeless Coalition COVID-19 response and prevention plan that Beth has worked really hard to put together. And I know there's been a team effort to get some of the things worked out. Um, you know, this is one of the hardest issues that exists out there um, because there's valid points on both sides on how we deal with homeless, especially now. Um, but what, what I can tell you is I agree with many of the things that I've heard from the sheriff. Um, but I also have to err on the side of caution in our thinking, and, and I encourage that, uh, and I'm glad we've gotten this far down the road because 40% of homeless people will contract COVID-19 is the prediction from the CDC. So in order to manage the threat, we have to really look at what and why, why we're doing things one way when we could be doing them better another. Those are kinds of evaluations are important. But just our thinking as a community, um, you know, one of the things I had to do uh, in myself as a human being was refrain from judgment many times. I grew up in a no worky, no eaty family. Uh, that, was <laughs> that was the attitude. And I mean, I had a job at nine years old working for a bird colonel, a uh, female, um, and I could never remember her first name because my father said never call Miss Becker by her first name. But uh, so looking at homelessness, but for the grace of God go I, I have to say that, and but for the least of these do it for me. Um, thank you, Curry County, for coming full circle. Um, like I said, it's a hard thing to navigate and everybody has a point to make that's valid, but the truth is for the greater good, we have to manage that spread. Uh, and uh, thank you all the hard work that we do. Uh, I'm grateful, and uh, I know the people that we serve are grateful. And Sheriff, thank you for being devout and steadfast in your service to this community. And I know we have extremes, but the bottom line is we're walking down the middle together and that happens in this room. And all of us have a piece and a measure in that responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. All right. Next, we are going to move on to seven discussion and action items. A, repeal order. 20842, closing transient lodging facilities. Ms. Schmelzer. Um, just a real quick. So the agenda, the amenda, I'm sorry, the agenda was amended last Friday night, about an hour or so after it was published. So um, the thing that was added was clarification on Executive Order 2012 and RV parks. Do you want me to take that first? Sure, go ahead. Okay. You are right. I'm sorry. So what was added to the agenda was um, basically a brief discussion, which really may not even be pertinent right now. But um, the governor had in Executive Order 20-12, she had actually put a statement in there about the RV parks and it was kind of ambiguous as to whether or not they were closed or not. So across the state, people just have been complying with it and they closed the RV parks. Um, but the way you read it, um, it could have, maybe they shouldn't have been closed. Um, there was some confusion on how they were written. So what I did was I looked at the difference between um, how Curry County defines campground and RV park and so there was a difference. My recommendation was to um, basically take a position on whether or not we felt RV parks were intended to be closed by the executive order. I did talk to the governor's office on it, and they said, you're right, it's a gray area, and we know that people have been questioning it, but so far people have been complying with it and keeping the RV parks closed. So I was going to ask you for your interpretation on it so we could then proceed. My interpretation is the RV parks should not have been closed by the way it's written, and I was going to ask you to open the RV parks. However, Tuesday, um, yesterday, the governor actually did open the, the campgrounds. 
So I really think it's a moot issue at this point. So, um, but I think, um, so I don't know if you want to take any action on the order in front of you or just pass over it since the campgrounds were opened. I think because the governor's already superseded it, it's moot, like as Beat you say, it? it's moot. Okay, so just for clarification, our <coughs> RV parks can be open. Yes. Beyond. I have, a, I have a question for clarification. Would our, if there is a question, would our re repeal of the lodging, is it a question of whether an RV park is a lodging that we've put caps on? It's a campground. I, I under, yeah, I understand, but I think, that, anyway. I agree. I understand what Council yeah. is saying. So if, if you're not calling it a campground, is it a transient lodging? And by repealing transient lodging, does that, in effect, open them up as well? Right. I, 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 don't, see a, I don't see a harm in doing it just to eliminate any question. Right. Um, so that's all. Why don't we look at, before we even go at that, why don't we look at the, uh, the repeal order first? And okay. then that might just clear everything up okay. in, in one fell swoop. All right. So with the repeal order, um, which is repeal of order 20842, closing transient lodging facilities. So the um, board had closed transient lodging facilities until further notice on March 27th. And for the last three meetings, we've talked about opening up the, or rescinding that order so we could open up transient lodging. Um, the cities did ask us at the last meeting to hold off, as did some citizens. But we did have um, the city of Gold Beach on Monday voted to open their transient lodging effective Friday. Um, Brookings is going to meet this evening to discuss that. Um, my recommendation is we go ahead and repeal the order effective 5 o'clock today. Um, we do have press releases ready to go if the board is in support of that. The order does say that the um, facilities are recommended to comply with the CDC guidelines. Well, it doesn't say that they're recommended. It says they have to comply with CDC guidelines to reduce the spread of COVID-19 until the governor has declared Oregon is no longer in a state of emergency as it relates to COVID-19. Um, but aside from that, my recommendation is there be no further stipulations on it other than following the CDC guidelines. Further discussion, Commissioner Gold? Um, I spent some time calling some motels that were open on the coast up in Reedsport and um, Florence. Um, some of them were closed, not very many, but most of them were open and their um, rates of uh, occupancy were very low, lower than 50%. Um, I checked on what they were doing to alleviate uh, or sanitize their areas and um, they were going to great lengths to make sure that their areas were sanitized and going by CDC guidelines. So that made me feel better about, you know, what's going on because they were not uh, author or ordered to close like we ordered our establishments to close. So just saying. Commissioner Boyce. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. You know, I've been promoting fairly consistently fairly consistently with the cities to uh, come on board as a united front, send out a good message to possible travelers here, uh, just join up. Uh, and so what I've worked out, and I think the cities are probably waiting to see what we do today, because originally, as you know, they were on the 30th, Brookings was, and then Gold Beach is indefinitely. Uh, I can't say enough the amount of work that has gone in from the three city administrators and Summer Madison to try and, you know, the amount of documentation we've got on both sides of this issue. And none of this, I want to add, none of it, in my view, has been radical. It's been people that are very concerned, very committed to doing what's best for this county. Uh, but it, yet it's pretty diverse and contrasting in, in what we have all read. Um, so basically what this does is say we're going to, go 50% occupancy throughout the entire county, rent every other room for two weeks. We'll revisit this on the 22nd. Uh, in renting other rooms, I was in the lodging business a long time, and when you had a time when a room was not available, you did a deep clean. Sometimes that, that was usually the first part of the week because of the big weekend. Um, 
except for vacation rentals, they'd be 100% occupancy because that's a different program. They're usually families that are one big room or uh, one reservation that way. This would be effective on 5-8. I'm not speaking for the cities here. My hunch is if they can agree with this, they will probably do their best, again, to give the county a, a, unified, MS, a unified effort as we go out. Um, and then uh, I, I think maybe more importantly with in the long term with what we're looking at here. The other Curry businesses, I, I sat in on the governor's call yesterday too and uh, appreciate that you both did. Um, but we're pushing as hard as we can and you recognize I'm sure that some of our local counties, uh, neighbors are saying, okay, we've had two deaths in two and a half months. Both of those are in Lane County if you want to identify health regions of number three and number five. Just so the citizens know, that's Coos Curry, Douglas, Jackson, Josephine, and Lane counties. And we're on day 18 right now, and I'm pretty sure this is accurate, I'm almost positive, with no new cases uh, and no deaths in five of those six counties. Um, and the reason I say, and you recognized last night on the call that the the counties are getting pretty restless. Uh, I've got something here I could read from one of the Douglas County Commissioners. Um, I would love to read just some, some quick excerpts from some of the letters we've received so the public knows and is better informed. Um, and um, if, that time, if time permits, uh, as we make this critical, critical decision, I'm hoping this, the 5-8 the, uh, uh, the Friday uh, date would be acceptable to the entire county and go two weeks um, and uh, hope for the best and through the CDC and OHA guidelines I think we got a real good chance to keep uh, and, and I believe the other counties Coos County is a little bit of a different program with the Shutter Creek they've actually had two cases outside Shutter Creek I believe that is accurate of the 28 cases they have right now Josephine Jackson, they remain at 49, 24, no new cases. Um, Delnor County still just has one, uh, if you want to make them the seventh county. So that's what I'm proposing for the board to consider today, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that uh, we'll see what the cities, uh, how they might respond to that. I think this is a very responsible uh, approach. Um, I didn't offer you time to read this because this just got done yesterday afternoon and I figured we could have a discussion and give you time to, to review and hopefully uh, feel comfortable in approving. That's all I have for now. For me, I, um, I'm not into over-policing and micromanaging. Um, I think the CDC guidelines are very clear. Um, I think they're the best safe practices and I think we also need to realize as a county that this virus is going to be a fluid situation until we have a vaccine. Um, until we can clear this thing up where you can go in and get a shot from your doctor or pills or whatever it is and you are now vaccinated from this, this is going to continue to be a fluid situation and we need to be willing to as a board to readjust as if, if we need to. But I think at this time, it is imperative that we start to move this county forward immediately. Um, as noted, I would have liked to have done it weeks ago. Um, but uh, this board chose to do something different, which I, I was fine with. Um, but now I think we have an opportunity. I think with the cities preparing to reopen, um, we need to do this and we need to do it, I hope, today. Um, and I do not believe we need to... Um, do anything more than CDC guidelines to move this forward uh, and not over police everything in the county but you know what to have a potential spot check of, of something every now and then absolutely I think that should be done but but I, I would rather the hoteliers and the and the RV parks and and that police themselves and do the right thing for the community um, so those would be my basic comments on it um, Commissioner Gold um, first of all, we do not have the personnel to police this. And not only that, I don't think the motels are going to want to do something that is not in their best interest. People are not going to want to come to the motels if they're not sanitized. 
I know when I called these various motels, they were very anxious to tell me what they were doing as far as sanitizing and take, taking care of their guests. A lot of them did every other room, and that was their choice to do that. So uh, I just don't think we have the personnel to police all of this. Okay. Sheriff Ward? <clears throat> Good morning, Commissioners. Sheriff Ford. <clears throat> I wrote down a couple things. There's a couple of dates that I had on here. I want to make sure I got right. <clears throat> April 22nd, the BOC voted unanimously for reopening transient lodging in Curry County by May 1st. The order to repeal was to be brought back for a final vote the following week. April 29th, 2020, the BOC voted 2 to 1 to postpone the opening of lodging for an additional week to discuss bring back May 6th for consideration against, again, to repeal the order 20842, closing transient lodging in Curry County. One commissioner kept saying, just give me one more week. That week has come and gone, and it's time to make a decision to repeal the order and reopen our transient lodging effective today. I know this is a controversial issue, but it's time to stop the indecisions so people can get on with their lives. Just a reminder that the governor did not shut down transient lodging anywhere in Oregon. It was decided to do so by each county on the coast and the cities in those counties. In doing research throughout the rest of Oregon, I found no non-coastal counties that had any issues with open up lodging or open with open lodging, even if those areas are destination areas. There are no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Curry County. There have been about 200 people that tested and all negative except for the initial four and they have all recovered. I make my recommendations based on facts and data I have researched and not of the what ifs and the unknowns. If we fail to act, it is inevitable that our economy will fail and just not now, but our future. We only really have control over what the county has taken steps to do and not what the governor has ordered. We have to jump through some hoops to reopen our county because of the governor's order, but we can reopen our lodging now. <clears throat> the city of Gold Beach have already voted and to open up their transient lodging without restrictions starting this Friday at noon. And, I and I, what I understand, Brookings is going to be voting on theirs tonight. I'm not sure what the outcome will be. It is time to start the process of opening up our county, starting with our lodging facilities without restrictions. Stop telling our citizens what they can and can't do. They are all intelligent, and we will continue to do what's necessary to protect themselves and others by social distancing and other precautions that are recommended by the CDC and OHA. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Commissioner Boyce? You know, there's a segment. Uh, of our population out there that are very educated on this. They're regionally concerned. They're long-time residents. The president has asked for a gradual reopening. That's why we come up with the 50% occupancy for two weeks. May is not a busy month. As you have said, others have said, and I think it's accurate, there's not going to be this onslaught of people coming here. However, a rotating of rooms for two weeks a gradual reopening is going to be the best shot we've got to get the rest of the businesses open. We match up with the other counties at some point, and I'm not recommending this right now, but at some point, the other counties collectively say, we are going to get our businesses open. If the governor waits till July 1st, we are not going to, we are not going to comply with that. The lives of our people here are at stake. The livelihoods of our people here are at stake. I'm asking Mr. Chair for a gradual reopening bring the county together, hear the voices from all sides. And by the way, there's nothing in here that recommends, nor would I approve of uh, any kind of uh, enforcement that basically is going to be looking over people's shoulders. Our people have been, especially our lodging people, have been incredibly agreeable and helpful and compliant in trying to do the right thing here. All I'm asking for, don't rent 100 percent of your rooms before May 22nd. Let's get another 14 days to add that 18 with no new cases. Gradual. Steady wins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anything further? <clears throat> All 
All right, I will make a motion to repeal order 20842 with the addition and amendment to that order that the transient lodging facilities follow the CDC guidelines. I'll second that. Further discussion? Roll, please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. Ms. Hunter. Yeah, effective today, yes, at 5 o'clock was the order that Ms. Uh, or Ms. Schmelzer had read. Ms. Hunter. Sorry to do this, but <clears throat> I think it's really important <clears throat> to, I, I'm not surprised by the vote. And <clears throat> um, the bottom line is deciphering the greater good is the hardest thing that any uh, Board of Commissioners has to determine in this time. And I am so sorry that any of you have had to make the kinds of decisions that you have to make. Because these are life and death decisions in many ways. Um, most of all, I appreciate the, the attitude of everybody working on this was to manage the risk that the state has allowed us to, to um, put on ourselves. In other words, if the state doesn't give you guidelines that says you, you do thus and so, then you are on your own, and anything that you choose to do or not do, you become responsible for it in, in uh, terms of liability. So I like the fact that there was great thought put into this. I like the fact that there is uh, a plan to go forward. Um, people don't know this, but one of the things that I did in Arizona before I came here was I wrote the first, the 501c3 that created the nonprofit that uh, created a destination marketing organization and the first marketing plan for downtown Scottsdale. Tourism development beats in my veins as much as veterans advocacy because I was raised in Scottsdale. Um, but the first order of business that should happen if we should choose at this time to convene a council of governments, which I think we should, because if there's one thing that this whole process has taught us is that there are pieces of the puzzle and pieces of planning that need to be done at the council of governments level and we don't have that. And that caused confusion with words like task force or um, the work that needs to be done between the cities and the county. What do we call that? Well, it's the, work, the level of planning for a council of government. You guys have navigated it as best as possible. And the cities have done a fantastic job navigating as best as possible. None of us have done this before. So stick to the plan. Fine tune that plan. Stay flexible. Uh, there's one thing that Commissioner Cash brings to the table today, and that's leadership. And he's been trained to make hard decisions. Now, <clears throat> Commissioner Boyce is the son of a Marine. From the time he was born, he was being trained to be a Marine <laughs> and to make those hard decisions. And Commissioner Gold, we are never going to see eye to eye, but I know we see heart to heart and, and many, many things. Um, I can see your eyes. Uh, I, I, uh, we'll just roll with it today, okay? I'm down here with my gray, my gray skunk stripe and risking my life, but I'm here to thank you all for your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Hunter. All right, moving on to 7B, uh, request to open Curry County as part of state's proposed three-phase approach. Ms. Schmelzer. Um, that was the amended area. One, that's the one on that's on the website right now. Uh, My goodness, this is a county issuing dog licenses. How about that one? <laughs> yeah, Hold that's on. where I am. Oh. Well, I've got that on on this page here, but on the one on the website, it's something different. Yeah, I don't know why. Get through the whole thing. And B was dog licenses. Okay. The dog All right, yeah, B dog licenses, uh, issuing dog licenses, Ms. Schmelzer. 
Okay, so the county has dis the commissioners have discussed this before, um, and um, so we brought it back for the final order, which is or should the or, or I shouldn't say final, but the order which would actually give us the um, authority to begin issuing dog licenses again ourselves. Uh, we would retain those fees. In addition, other agencies that issue licenses can continue to do that. Um, after this, we'll have to follow up with a fee schedule um, that'll be part of our June fee schedule that we bring forward. That's all we have on this right now. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, you ready? Commissioner Boyce, go ahead. You ready for a motion? Yes. I'm going to make a motion that we approve the order for uh, following up on county county issuing the dog licenses. I'll second that. For the discussion, roll please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Aye. Chair Pash. Aye. We're issuing dog licenses carrying unanimously. Aye. D. Pocket Park in Gold Beach. Ms. Schmelzer. Okay. So we have two matters regarding Pocket Parks today and just so everyone knows, Pocket Parks are just those small little sitting areas or um, fountain areas that cities often have. You typically at the, in our county, they tend to be at um, the cor corner of two, where two streets converge or where they meet. So in Gold Beach, we have one. It's right down here. It's on Moore Street and Ellensburg Avenue. It's at the Stop and Go Light. Um, it used to be a little fountain. Now it's just a treat area with some benches. The county actually owns that property and we lease it to the city of Gold Beach. We do five-year renewals or five-year leases. It's a dollar a year. Um, so basically what item D does is it renews that lease with the city of Gold Beach. Now I do want to say that the city of Gold Beach is interested in acquiring this property at some point um, if we'd ever want to transfer it to them. But for now, um, before you would, is just renewal of the existing lease. Do I have a motion? I move that we uh, continue the existing lease or renew it. Do I have a second? Second, Mr. Chair. Further discussion? <clears throat> Roll, please. Mr. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. All right. E is another pocket park in Brookings. Okay. This one is called Oasis. It's at the corner of Hillside and Chequa Avenue, which is 101. We've discussed this property earlier this year. It is the same terms as the Gold Beach lease, so it's a dollar a year, five years, and they can renew it after that. Um, this property, just, just a minor note, is the order t said that the legal <coughs> description was attached. We didn't get a legal description, and I spoke to counsel. He said we really don't need it for purposes of this. So the order was just revised to say the lease and map tax lot information is attached instead of the lease and the legal description. So it's just minor technicality. I did want you to be aware of that there was that minor change made to the order though. Um, staff's recommendation is we proceed with entering into this lease. Commissioner Boyce? Yeah, I'm a little bit familiar with this one. Would that be, I, think, I couldn't find a size in here, not to put you on the spot, that roughly be maybe a quarter acre? No, no. About a quarter of an acre across from State Farm Insurance there. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's two parcels. It actually involves two pieces of land. One is 0 .05 acres and the other is 0 .08 acres in size. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chair, I'll move that we uh, approve the, the new lease, Pocket Park, City of Brookings, bottom of Hillside Street. I'll second that. Further discussion? Roll, please. Mr. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. All right, it is 10 o'clock. We're going to take a 10 minute recess. We will reconvene at 10 10. Chair? I should have brought this up in, the, in advance, but today is, this week is the week of National Corrections Officers. And I appreciate Commissioner Boyce's uh, uh, announcements every day about the line of deaths and duties. But uh, just let me read this real quick. Like I say, this is put out by my jail commander, Lieutenant Joel Hensley, about the This Week in National Officers Week. In 1984, President Ronald Reagan signed the National Proclamation declaring This Week as Corrections Officer Week. As part of this presentation of the proclamation, he said, 
No group of Americans has more difficult or less publicly visible job other than the brave men and women who work in our corrections facilities. I believe President Reagan's quote rings more true today than ever. Every day our deputies put their boots on and come to work. They purposely come to a location where they know they will be facing challenges that will test their knowledge, skills, and professionalism. They also know that most days the same people in custody that tested them yesterday will still be there every day testing them for the extended period of time, looking for an opportunity to take advantage of them. Every year it seems like the challenges faced by all law enforcement are growing and becoming more complex. I want to thank my corrections deputies for the hard work they do and uh, I appreciate them so much for everything that they've done for our community and our, our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. We'll reconvene in 10 minutes. Back in session. Moving on to our next um, discussion action item, it would be 7F, liaison assignment. Ms. Schmelzer. Okay, the board discussed this um, once before, and so I'm just following up to make it official, but we talked about uh, doing the new liaison assignment for emergency services. It tends to make sense that the um, person who has the sheriff's department also have the emergency services or emergency services division. So um, this, we would just need a motion and a second on this to uh, appoint Commissioner Pash as the liaison to emergency services. I move that we approve uh, making Commissioner Pash as the liaison to the Emergency Services Department. Discussion, I presume. We have a second first, please. I'll second. Further discussion? So this, uh, the citizens need to know, uh, Mr. Chair, that this is to replace me, correct? Uh, you, were, you were the liaison, yes. Okay, so why are we doing that? Uh, Ms. Melzer? No, why don't you answer it? I have, I have had no conversation about this. If you'd like to know the absolute truth about this, Commissioner, yeah. I have had no conversation with anyone about becoming the liaison for emergency <laughs> services other than I believe Ms. Schmelzer asked me if it came up, would I be willing, and I said yes. Other than that, I have had no conversation with Mr. Dumeyer. I'm not accusing you of that, sir. No, I'm not saying you have. I'm just, I'm just, you asked me a question, I'm answering it. I've had no your conversation with them, Mr. Dumeyer. Quick to second to vote. So this this comes as a real surprise, and I will wait for uh, your okay to uh, speak to this, Mr. Chair. Okay. Can I? Did you want me to expound any further? I, I will just say, I have had no conversation with anybody about this from my office, other than some Ms. Schmelzer asking me if I if it came up, would I be willing? And I said yes. Ms. Schmelzer. Okay. Um, we discussed this a couple weeks ago in executive session. We came out and staff was to proceed as directed, which was to bring forward a new liaison assignment. I don't, I don't recall that we were discussing specific liaison assignment uh, amendments in the middle of the year. We've only been, uh, this is only the fifth month, so I'm not, uh, not sure where or why this is going. So uh, if I may, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I've been here every day, no exceptions, since the 1st of March, and uh, for what it's worth, I've taken my temperature three times a day the entire month month of March, and I put a smile to that because I want to be sure that uh, that one symptom didn't uh, <coughs> didn't come to co yeah. didn't come to me, and it and it didn't. Um, here comes Eric. <laughs> So I want to read real quick, and there's a, there's a very important reason why I want to follow through with this, Mr. Chair. Um, on uh, January 31st, President Trump stops all flights from China. On 15th, he declares a national emergency. On March 13th, he declares a national COVID-19 emergency. I followed every one of these actions very, very closely. On February 28th, Governor Brown appointed the State of Oregon's coronavirus response team. 29th, Department of Human Services issued strict guidelines restricting visitation. I'm not going to read them all, just the ones I think that are pertinent here uh, for the public to hear, the citizens. Uh, congregated visitation at congregated care facilities, including nursing homes. On March 2nd, the State of Oregon Emergency Coordination Center was activated. On March 8th, declared an emergency under uh, the law due to the public health threat posed by novel infectious 
uh, coronavirus, March 12th, prohibited gatherings of 250 or more people and announced a statewide closure. Um, on March 17th, uh, 25 or more people banned. I'm abbreviating here, Mr. Chair. On March 23rd, uh, the governor ordered Oregon going to stay home, save lives. And there's, there's plenty more. Uh, the reason I highlight this is because I said I was here every day. Um, you know, I, it, my, my, my past business lodge, uh, I came extremely close to losing my lodge. The biscuit fire, you know, winds are something that we are very fearful of during a fire, but sometimes they become our ally. So the Blossom Bar fire uh, didn't come that close, but we got a win, an extremely rare win in the month of August that sent the fire back towards California. I shall never forget. The Blossom, or excuse me, the uh, Chetco Bar fire. Um, I called a meeting on July 7th firefighters at all levels, federal government, BLM, Forest Service. Uh, I had five uh, of our 13 uh, fire chiefs represented, Coos Forest Protective Association, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service. That was on July 7th. I said, hey guys, you're the experts here. Tell me if you think we're not headed for one of the worst fire seasons ever. Exactly five days later, we discovered the Checo Bar fire. Three days after that, I'm in the sheriff's office with the sheriff, and I'm begging then District Ranger Lanier to put the fire out. I never stopped begging her to put the fire out. On 821, you know what happened. It exploded, and in, in, uh, the 22nd, uh, it, the fire went towards Brookings uh, 18 miles in 34, 35 hours. Back to the winds. Brookings was spared. But that entire time, uh, I was fighting on that fire put it out. I was there every single morning. One year later, the Klondike fire. I'm there every single morning reading the I-209 reports. And um, sometimes I'd stay in my car at night and sleep because that's what I signed up for. And I thought Brookings, this county, was an unbelievable risk. The miracles ensued. Um, since then, I've worked nonstop with the Oregon Department of Forestry, Coos Forest, BLM, including a trip to Washington, D.C., and, of course, the U.S. Forest Service, not to mention the Governor's Fire Response Council. One of the biggest, and in abbreviating, Mr. Chair, one of the biggest things that, uh, that I have promoted, especially the last couple of months, despite the public health crisis that we have with the coronavirus, I have responsibly promoted that if this fire season, and I'm calling a meeting at the end of this month with the same people, to ask for their expertise and their advice on how we best prepare. I have a letter here that I'll show you later on to uh, Glenn Casamasa. I'm battling to get resources here every minute and as soon as possible with the Forest Service. So in calling this additional meeting, um, if we have the fire season that we're anticipating, that I'm anticipating, not to cry wolf, not to panic, <coughs> be responsible, um, southwestern Oregon, in particular Creek County, will possibly, maybe even likely, be subject, subject to the worst or most at-risk area three of the last four years. As you know, we had a little bit of a break last year, and I'm hoping and praying that's the same this year. So the point is this. Uh, the, when, the, when the highway collapsed, I was there when it reopened and watched the first four cars come through south to north. All of them were out-of-state license plates, by the way. I don't remember the exact date, but I think it was the end of March. And then I ran up to the other end and uh, got to say hi to Ron Fowler, who passed away a month later, the incredible man that ran South Coast Lumber for a long time. He just happened to be the first car to go through south to north. I suspect he was in Gold Beach for medical reasons. Um, at any rate, it was a real honor to be able to spend a couple minutes with him and watch him go through. Um, I'm just very surprised that I'm being replaced on this. I see no basis for it. I just want the citizens to know that I will continue, even if I'm voted off the island here, <laughs> I will continue to be here every day until fire season, almost every day, until fire season is, uh, is closed, officially. And I hope it's in September of 2020. I don't know. Uh, but we are at great risk, and I'm not going to uh, have anyone I'm, I'm responsible to people, 
So I want to stay as emergency manager lays on. That's what I've been doing when the other commissioners weren't around the first two years. Okay, and uh, I took the lead. I took the effort or made the effort, and uh, that's not going to change. So. Um, there's plenty more I could say. I really appreciate this time, Mr. Chair, uh, but it's been moved and seconded, and I'm going to ask you to amend your vote and uh, leave me on as emergency management coordinator. If you could have seen the sheriff and I in the off in his office that day when the fire was just four days old, three to four days old, and we're begging her to put the fire out with everything we've got and continual acknowledgement and reminder. We're at great risk, and then you know what happened four days later. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I'll say this. I, I appreciate your work um, on that, on the fires. I, as you know, when you and I first met, um, Southwest uh, Oregon, uh, the LLC that we formed to help, uh, you know, mitigate the losses and protect South County. So I do appreciate your work on it, and I, I hope your work would continue um, and your care for this county. Evidently, uh, I'm also um, sub suspecting that there is personality issues uh, with, um, you know, different people involved in this, and that could be a driving force behind it. Uh, but also, we're, you know, and I and I, I'm sure you know, emergency uh, emergency services aren't only fire, um, but it's it's the whole gambit of whatever can happen in the county. And and again, I appreciate your um, your response and your responsibilities with what you've done in the past, um, but um, I'd, I'd like to go ahead and move the motion forward. Mr. Chair. Further discussion? Yes, sir. Thank you again. I just want the public to know I think this is uh, punitive, and I think that uh, if you have oversight of county employees, if you don't toe the line, you're going to pay the price, and that's what's happening here. So uh, I made the statement not too long ago that if anybody gets in my way, of my responsibility to the citizens with this fire you're not going to find anybody's had more experience with floods. You're not going to find anyone's got more experience with fire, it's at least that's sitting on this board. And so I think this is a bad decision, and I'm going to stand firm on prepare, get ready. Hopefully I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm overstating it, but I'm going to get the experts to help me prepare this county. That's all I have. Further discussion? Roll, please. Commissioner Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce? No. Chair Pash? Aye. Motion carried two to one. Next is G, order selecting a firm to conduct a feasibility study. We have a comment from Mr. Barnes. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, David Barnes. I didn't listen in on the meeting that you had with the people who are going to do this for you, but I remember when this first came up a while ago, um, there's, I know that there was grant money that was available for building a building. Um, if we use it as a sheriff's department in jail, anything else we build in the footprint is included in it. Um, I don't know how much this feasibility study costs, but I'm wondering how much we're looking at spending on a new complex. And like I've heard so many times in this room, where's the money coming from? Well, we're just looking into it right now, but we are we do need to move forward. I think it's been noted not only by this board, but by our sheriff's department, by our district attorney's office, through the judges. Um, the building over there, the courthouse, is becoming unsafe. Mm -hmm. It's literally becoming an unsafe building. There, um, you know, in our in our in investigations currently, there are some. Um, state and federal funds that will come available for this there are some grant there is some grant money but we're also going to have to raise some money uh, how much will it cost and how much will will the county be on the hook for um, has yet to be determined i think the feasibility study the, that's the, the thrust of the feasibility study is to see if it's even feasible to do it right now um, and if it is you know the costs and how to how to raise those funds where it would be how it would be set up and let the experts let the jail people tell them what they need let the sheriffs tell them what they need the judges and so on could we incorporate all of the county offices into one structure um, which would be cost saving for everyone and the state and federal or federal government pay their parts into the courthouse part of it and someone else pay money into the jail part of it 
uh, perhaps a bond or something like that having to be passed. But I think the first step here would be the feasibility study, and some of that can be, I believe, has been or will be grant funded. Um, so that's what we're looking at for that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Boyce? Well, I know it's been on record. I just want the public to know the jail is the issue, and that's still at least, I suspect, especially with what we're dealing with now, 10 years out, uh, the courthouse has not fallen down. Uh, is it unsafe? I disagree with that. I am concerned. Uh, it's just the interest, Mr. Chair, of priorities, and uh, we put a lot of money. I want the public to know over the last few years we put a lot of money into the roof, windows, uh, sidewalks, and, uh, uh, you know, I just can't get on board with this as a priority. Um, you know, my dad built that jail a long time ago, and it's due uh, if we perhaps consider segregating out between the jail and the courthouse. That may not be practical, but it may be a, something for reasonable consideration. Um, and I think that that's, I think that's the best way to serve the citizens. The new courthouse, uh, I've, I've tried to follow this and uh, read the information, the studies, and I just don't want to see more money right now going to this. Uh, but um, I, I don't want to be disagreeable. I'm just a concern of, again, where, where's, our, where's our priorities? Okay. Yes. So um, just to do an introduction on this agenda item here. So um, the board did decide that we would put out an RFP for a feasibility study. We did put the RFP out. And we had um, seven consultants that had submitted their bids to us. We did put together a panel. It consisted of county commissioners, facilities maintenance staff, uh, someone from courts, and then someone from the sheriff's office in the jail. Um, who narrowed that list down. We then proceeded with interviews. We interviewed the top two. Um, in addition to that panel we just talked about, we also added uh, Council Huddle to the interview panel. And we did uh, narrow it down to ORW Architecture. And, well, we narrowed it uh, we narrowed it to the two and then selected ORW Architecture in there. And then we did say that we wanted to have um, reference checks done. Commissioner Gold had uh, volunteered to do the reference checks, so she did four reference checks, and she shared all of the results with me. They were all very favorable. There were no negative comments at all. So um, it's staff's recommendation that we go ahead with the order and that we bring a contract back to you at the next meeting. And I'd like to also, if you would, comment on the, the firm um, and their local ties as sure. well. Not, oh. a, not this is not a Portland firm. It's a you know it's more localized. Right. ORW Architecture is a, a Southwest Oregon firm. They're based in Medford. They did a lot of projects for Jackson County. They did jails. They did courthouses. They did justice uh, buildings. They did public health buildings. They have a pretty uh, pretty impressive resume when it comes to projects very similar to what we're looking to do here. Um, just one thing I forgot to say too is um, the 2009 report that was done which showed the need to replace our facility was shared with them um, so they do have that background information as well and they believe that they're um, that, that they're qualified that they can do a good job and based on the references and what they submitted and in the interview I have to agree with them so the next phase is to just move forward and do the contract with them uh, staff will continue to pursue grants to offset any expenses and um, this should be by the end of this year, by the end of this calendar year, we should be ready to enter into the next phase of the project based on what that feasibility study tells us. Do I have a motion? I move that we approve the contract with, is it ORW? Um, you'll be approving, um, selecting them, and then we would bring the contract back at the next meeting. Okay. So I move that we select this firm to do the um, feasibility study for the courthouse combination, everything. Do I have a second? If I could ask a clarifying question. Yes, counsel. Subject to getting an, a contract, you know, so it's the next step is to bring back a contract. So technically there will still be one more vote before Correct. they're actually locked mm -hmm. in. Okay. I'll second. Further discussion? Roll, please. Mr. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Staff Jez, would it okay if I say nay? <laughs> nay is fine. <laughs> <laughs> no, nay. Commissioner uh, Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried two to one. 
And just so everyone in the public knows, this is not only for the courthouse, but this is for the jail and the sheriff's department as well. And the administrative and, office. And staff, exactly. All right, so next we are going to have H has been, or I'm sorry, let's see. Yes. H has been tabled, so we're going to move on to I campgrounds. Okay, I is um, just basically to let the board know that the governor did um, say that the campgrounds can be opened. So um, county campground, um, we have two of them. We have Lobster Creek, which is not ready to open just because of the condition that it's in. We talked about that at the last meeting. But we will be opening Boyce Cope then on Friday. And we do have, um, we've been in contact with the park host to tell him about the extra precautions and the sterilization things that he's going to have to do in the restrooms, some of the other areas. Encouraged him to try and lease every other site, make them go every other site if possible. Um, that'll give more social distancing and also time for park tables and stuff to air out, um, if at all possible. But we also um, are installing a hand sanitizing station up there between the two restrooms. We do have laminated posters to put on the doors with the governor's recommended outdoor recreation guidelines. Um, we are sending the camp post um, 50 handouts to hand to all the campers that come in there so they are aware of the guidelines. And then uh, Chet from Facilities Maintenance is also going up there with some special sterilization, disinfectant stuff. and paper towels and things of that nature. So we're going to be doing a press release to actually open that campground uh, based on the governor's decision yesterday to open the campgrounds. We'll also be notifying the local campgrounds that they can open as well. Quick question, Ms. Schmelzer, uh, Lobster Creek, when, do we have a timeline to get that open? So Lobster Creek, um, you know, we don't have any reservations at the current time because of COVID, but also because they're we tend to get busier in uh, August, is a busy month there. Um, we're actually working on putting together a work crew yeah. to go up there, employees. Um, Economic Development Coordinator Madison was interested in getting a work crew up there. Um, she's already talked to several employees. We're going to be putting it out to the rest of them to see if we can get them up there to start cleaning it up. Um, and then one thing I want to do is sell some of our county properties. As you know, the proceeds can go to maintain the parks. I'd like to see that go to actually rebuilding those little cabins because they are beyond their useful life. I mean, they're full of mold, rot, things of that nature. Right. So um, we're trying to get that work crew set up for the next month if possible. And once I think once it's cleaned up, we can open it back up before we even rebuild facilities. But right now it's I mean there's a lot of hazards out there tripping hazards branches down on the roads uh, long grass fire hazards so once we take care of that we'll open it back up okay so rival Commissioner Boyce thank you again um, that is just an incredible piece of property um, the work crew we, we need to recruit as many people as we can um, and you know, you're going to have weed eaters and all the rest of it. And you mentioned last week hauling stuff out of there. Um, and, uh, oh, just one quick, I'm sorry, just one quick clarification. I think Council Huddle picked up on this earlier today. Uh, just for the public, the confusion on day use only on the parks and full full open. Uh, could you clarify that? Sure. The parks, the day use, um, par the day use part of the parks has always been open. The governor never closed the day use area. It's just the campground portion that she closed and that she opened yesterday. So thank you. All right. So we don't really need a motion on it. It's just clarification. And if the board had concerns, we could talk about them. Okay. Moving on to Jay petitioning the governor. Okay. So yesterday the governor in the governor's uh, call with the commissioners and uh, other people, um, the governor did announce that we're eligible to petition to open for phase one and she's going to start accepting those petitions on Friday and there's certain things we have to do. The biggest part of that is public health has to put together a plan that addresses seven elements or seven criteria that the governor is requiring to be addressed in that plan. So I um, spoke with public health administrator Sheree Ward. She had most of the plan already done. Um, but she was putting some tweaks on it. She was trying to get it done last night. There's a little bit more she wanted in there, um, but she's for sure going to be ready to have that submitted on Friday. I actually have my petition statement. It just has to be a one sentence petition basically. And so we're ready. Um, we're getting prepared and we'll be sending that off 
on Friday. Um, one thing the board needs to discuss is we can either petition as a county or as a region. And um, in speaking with the public health administrator, our recommendation is we petition as a county, not as a region. Um, and that's due to some of the other counties have higher cases. So we're in a, we're in a great spot. You know, we've we have only had those four. Uh, we've had no hospitalizations, so we want to just proceed as a county. But we do want the boards um, to weigh in on that. And I will say that all of us were on the call yesterday with the governor, uh, with their office for this meeting, um, and it was clear, it was made clear to us um, near the end of the meeting that they would try and expedite this um, as quickly as they can if we have them ready uh, to be sent in on Friday and that the rural counties I felt like would be an easier push than the, than the larger counties. And I, I just want to let everyone know Cherie Ward is working hard and as fast as she can to get everything met that the governor's office is asking for so that uh, Ms. Schmelzer can have this ready uh, for examination in the governor's office on Friday morning. So we don't really even... I guess just, I just want to make sure the, the board is okay with us petitioning to go as a county and not as a region. So do you want a motion to that effect? That would help you. Okay, I move that we move forward with this application with the uh, petition with the governor for phase one approval and we will be doing it as a county. Do I have a second? I'll second for the discussion. Mr. Chair, yes, thank you. Um, I miss that somehow. Uh, boy, I'm real uncomfortable not challenging the governor's region. Uh, do I suspect that our plan will not be adequate? Of course, I'm, I'm very optimistic that uh, some great work went into that. Um, the discussion should be, are we better off sending an individual plan or do we want a regional plan? I, I, if I miss that, I apologize. However, uh, my, my intuition is, boy, we want to, especially when it comes to uh, trying to get uh, the money from the Federal Emergency yeah. Relief CARES Act back through the state to the counties. <clears throat> so um, I, th I think that deserves a conversation. What, what's your thoughts there? Well, I, I personally, for the CARES Act and the money, yes, regions, there's strength in numbers, absolutely, for those kind of things. But to get <clears throat> the governor to approve us for, for stage one to reopen our, some of our local businesses, our restaurants, <clears throat> Sorry, uh, those kind of things. Uh, I, I would prefer to act as a smaller county because, again, we have no active cases. We've we're you know we're out of the 14-day um, grace period. We've had no deaths. Uh, it's it's much easier for us to. I think we're pretty much slam dunk to qualify that a paper's going to cross their desk and they're going to go, okay. And Miss Ward's done what she's supposed to do. Everything's in place. Go uh, where some of these counties are going to investigate. Uh, especially counties that have, like our North County, you know, they've got the prison and that up there. Those those things are going to be investigated on the releases and the, you know, the participating people and all those. They might want to chase some of that down, <clears throat> where I think us filing as a county with no cases, um, that I think a lot of that is moot and it'll actually help to expedite the application. So I think we're talking about two different things here as, you know, to get us open for phase one is one part. But yes, absolutely, to ask for the CARES Act money to be brought back into this county, I 100% agree that the more, the more people we have on board with that to move forward a, as a uniform body, the more strength we'll have. Thank you. Just want to add a comment to that. I'm actually not getting a lot of traction on a joint effort with the other counties on the, uh, you know, they, I, I still think it's the best way to go to team up, but I'm not sure if uh, the other counties are in agreement with that. Maybe down the road. And after yesterday's conversation, it might be more likely. Thank you. Uh, when I was listening to the meeting yesterday, it seemed to me that it's going to be up to the legislature to determine how much each county gets from the... Oh, boy, that's real encouraging. If that's true. <laughs> well, that's what oh, oh, the God. governor said. Is that yeah. what you okay. understood? With super majorities in both the House and the well, Senate. I'm just saying, yeah. that's what was sadly, said. Uh, sadly, we're going to be far down the list on that one. Uh, Mr. Melzer? Just a comment on the funding. So OHA has already told us that we're eligible for up to $52,000 in reimbursement on what we spent through public health. So 
um, Sheree Ward is already working on that application, putting together those numbers. I think she might have already sent that in. And then through our insurance carrier, we're eligible for some reimbursements as well. And Julie Swift in payroll and, pers and personnel is actually working on putting together those numbers for that. <coughs> so, you know, we're still going to get a lot of reimbursements. Yes, we want to try and get as much reimbursed as possible, but we are trying to get reimbursed with whatever opportunities we are seeing right now. So even if um, even if CARES Act takes a while or we don't get as much as we want, we will be able to at least recoup some of our expenses. Okay. Commissioner Boyce, thank you again. Uh, I thought the 52 already come in a month ago. Do I have a different figure there? No, it's, um, it, so they announced it about a month ago, okay. and then we had to, Shree had to put in her expenses for public health, like what public health employees spent or was there additional expenses. So she, smith, she submitted that maybe a week or so ago. And at that time, it, it, there were kind of rotating or repeating opportunities there or even responsibilities to, to work on additional mm -hmm. funds. So I'm sure she's on that. Yeah, she's, okay. she's getting, we're, we're pursuing any funding we can right now. Thank you. Further discussion? Roll, please. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Aye. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. All right. We are up to 8, which is a public hearing at 11 o'clock, uh, but we've got a few minutes here. If we, I think we'll go ahead and move on to Director's Report, Ms. Schmelzer. Okay. I don't have too much for you. Um, so just want to talk a little bit about the Parks Coordinator position that we did put together a panel that did interviews. and. Um, um, he is going to be here during executive session so the board can meet him and approve that before we do a hire on that. And then also um, upcoming workshops, we do, we're going to get back on our schedule of having workshops again. So on the 20th, we're going to have a workshop on the salary study. And then on the 27th, we're going to have a workshop on some possible revenue streams or ideas for revenue sources that have come up. And then one thing I did want to share with you that I am really impressed with our staff on is the month of April was terrible, right? We were closed for the most part. It was hard for people to get in here and do businesses. But in our building safety <coughs> department, I just have to let you know that they took in um, almost $20,000 more in the month of April than the average. So they took in $38,000 and the average is 19000 and then um, from the previous year, so if I look at last year, they were 14000 ahead of last year. So um, Mark Bagman down there is doing an excellent job with his staff. I really can't stress back to our conversations about reforming that department and making it more uh, consumer friendly. It's really working, and I'm really happy to see that. I really thought we were going to take a big hit with COVID-19 in yeah. that department, right. but it, it was just the opposite. We did really well. And I wanted to share that with Pretty you. Pretty amazing. Yep. And that's all I had. All right. Moving on to Commissioner comments. Uh, Commissioner Gold. Uh, I've been working with All Care, and they've been getting grants out to various 501c3s that are, have been in need. Um, so that's been really good. They got some extra money from the state to do this. So every week the grants are, are given out, and I review the, the uh, applications. So. That's a positive thing that's been going on, like food banks have gotten money, um, that sort of thing. So that's all I have for today. Okay. I don't really have any public comments other than just um, I'm glad to see that um, our county is remaining, <coughs> um, you know, COVID-free right now. Mm -hmm. Can it happen? And will it probably happen? Yes, it will. But I think it's how we react to that and the steps that we continue to monitor that will be most important uh, I just ask everyone to stay strong and stay steady and um, we are moving forward that's all I have Commissioner Boyce I bet I can do this in 15 minutes huh? <coughs> um, just appreciate the discussion today on the liaison commissioners and also on the the, the reopen um, I really follow Brookings close and have admiration for all three of our cities, and I'm hoping that, because they were on the 30th, I hope they don't <laughs> go back to that, and we therefore send, I don't think they will, but uh, hopefully it won't, again, send out a mixed, mixed message. Um, 
Just one comment, minutes. I think it was uh, March 17th on the day wireless issue, um, the work that they've been doing. Uh, you know, I've worked with uh, Mike Robinson, uh, Coos Force Protective Association, and he still thinks there's ways that this county can save a lot of money and re retain and maintain a good relationship with day wireless. So I didn't uh, bring that up in the minutes, uh, but that wasn't highlighted enough. I just. Uh, I just really value his opinion. He's been here 30-some years. Uh, small businesses out there, uh, we have a special uh, community development block grant um, through Coos Curry Douglas Business Development, Tracy Loomis. It's called the Emergency Small Business and Micro Enterprise Assistant Grant. This is a one-time thing, uh, community option. Uh, I'm going to bring to the board for approval at some point um, there can only be two in a region, so in the three counties, Douglas is going to have one, and then Coos and Curry would have one uh, together. And that I think at some point that would probably need board approval, but this is the early stages. Uh, we have about 30 days on this, uh, but as part of the, Fed, uh, the FER plan for community development, you know, I'm drawing a blank. I thought I knew exactly federal emergency relief plan. Excuse me, there you go. <laughs> But it is a first-come, first-served basis. Uh, uh, CCD and Coos County would be doing all the paperwork. All we have to do is help position our people, if there's interest in small businesses, to understand this grant, and it'll move pretty fast. And uh, any connection we can have with Coos County, I'm more than happy to do. I've seen their commissioners work over the last three and a half years, and uh, they are very committed. Gribbins, uh, Maine, and, of course, John Sweet. Um, so we would be the second local government, um, but the funds would be issued in both counties or be available to both counties. What else do I need to say on that? Uh, maximum 30-day approval. So it moves, like I say, it moves pretty fast. And it will not count, this is really important, it will not count against uh, our regular uh, community development block grants. Um, and I've been promoting on my own. I haven't brought that to the board yet because of the two months delay we've had, but that's a Curry Re Resource Center across the street. Um, reworking that with uh, could be as much as a million dollars uh, and then the Port Orford Community Center would be the second one we could possibly qualify for both of those or they may as you know be in competition uh, but as you, the city of Port Orford has already raised uh, I think about eighty thousand dollars towards that project um, maybe more on that later uh, two timber sales have come up which I think are very good news one from the Bureau of Land Management one for the Forest Service both three to four million board feet. Uh, one is Powers, is called the Boom Sale, and the other one is the uh, from the BLM. He didn't have a nickname, um, but I just want to read something to the citizens why this is so important and the the time invested by the Oregon, excuse me, the Association of ONC Counties. Um, by the way, this was about a 1.3 million dollar bid. Went to the lowest bidder. There were three qualified bidders. Anyway, just a little side note here, other than I really want to stress the work that ONC has done on this, um, and, and I really, after the three years, actually two and a half years that I've been on the ONC board, I've seen the BLM come so far in meeting the 18 BLM counties, it's just really encouraging. It's somewhat like the change of attitude that the Forest Service has had in the last two years that I'm, uh, I think we're all incredibly thankful for. Um, but here is just a, some quick stats. It takes approximately 16,000 board feet of lumber to frame a 2,000 square foot home. What is average? 16,000 uh, or 6,000? I'm sorry, 1,600 square feet. So that's a little bit bigger than an average home. Um, One million board feet of timber is enough to build approximately 63 family size homes. So if you did the math, that would be seven times 63 would be. Uh, yeah, about 500,000 homes, or no, 500 homes, I'm sorry, there we go. <laughs> so that's that's good news for Curry County, and I think you're going to see more green timber sales. I'm continually working to uh, help South Coast get green timber sales. They, they don't, they're down in this corner of Oregon, they don't have, it's harder for them to make bids on these, these uh, BLM and Forest Service locations. They'd have to truck, obviously, a long ways from Powers, but I think they were probably one of the bidders in the uh, Powers. Um, Three million, four million board feet there. Um, 
I want the camera right here, Eric, if you don't mind. These are gotcha covered, the wonderful volunteers uh, the, in the, primarily in the Brookings area that have their sewing machines going uh, about 500 revs per minute. Um, they, these are tie-on masks. They would prefer wool. There's not a lot of free wool material available out there, but they're just doing an incredible thing. If, at some point, uh, if masks are uh, a good option for people that are within the service industry of Curry County, we're going to try our best. They're going to try their best. I don't want to take credit here other than just really sending a big uh, vote of approval and appreciation. Uh, they need they need all the, the donations that they can get. As I mentioned last week, close to 40. Um, as you know, Brookings canceled the Azalea Festival, postponed probably till the 1st of July. That's an 80-year tradition. That's uh, that's almost crushing in itself. That's a, that's been consistently a, a tremendously well-organized program for so many years. Of course, we lost our fair, um, and probably no way we'll be able to recover on that before 2021. But those are just great traditions that, if we fight hard and work and uh, and uh, pull up, pull the wagon together, we might be able to get those back and in full swing uh, down the road. Um, You know, I was going to talk about the governor's call yesterday. I think you both covered that well. Um, yeah, other than this, you did hear, uh, and I could actually I could just read a little bit of this uh, from Douglas County. Just they are they are having businesses, and it was touched on just a little bit today. That are basically <coughs> just saying, "I'm going to open up anyway. I got to feed my family." There's one st story of a lady running a hair salon in Salem, single mom with two kids, and uh, they. They, they not only tried to close her down, she was going to go back in today. I don't know what the, how the story will end, but the OSHA threatened, if it's accurate, and I believe it is, threatened to, to uh, fine her $70,000. She's been graciously keeping her distance and, and keeping her store closed, but this is what we're faced with, and some of the rural counties are saying, okay, we've, we've had two deaths in seven months from a half a million people, and uh, we've got to get our people back to work. So. Um, it's going to be awful hard for us to overrule the governor's deal, uh, executive order, but we may be faced with that at some point in time. I hope not. So we'll know more after the 15th. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. It is 10.53. Why don't we get up and stretch for a few minutes, and we'll have our public hearing at 11 o'clock. Uh, we're actually we're going back to number eight, which is a public hearing, Tyler Technologies for Orion assessment and taxation software service. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. You have somebody on the phone, too? I, I do. I was just going to let you I'm know. sorry. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Jim Cullen, Curry County Assessor. Um, we also have on the phone with us today Gio Giordano, uh, Senior Account Executive with Tyler. Thank you. And Good morning, everybody. And Paul Hutcherson, uh, project manager, also with Tyler, uh, two of the folks that we've been working with in, in uh, our research on uh, potential anti-software systems. Um, and you also have before you today uh, the Tyler Software as a Service Agreement contract for uh, getting a new software system for assessment and taxation for Curry County. This process for us actually started three or four years ago. We've been talking to the budget committee for some time, and it just was uh, the 1920 budget committee that finally approved funding for a new software package for Curry County. Uh, prior to that, uh, the budget committee just didn't come up with the money, and, and you may remember last year we came to you at the budget committee and, and told you we had two potential possibilities. We just wanted to see if we could get funding so we could con uh, complete our research on the software packages. Since then, we have completed our research on the software packages, really made our mind up um, in January of this year, and we've chosen the Tyler Orion software package we are currently using the Tyler 
I think they call it the legacy software package. We've had that software package since 1997. And, and so we've certainly got use out of it. Um, but this is the Orion software package is the is Tyler's newest and it's more of more like a Windows based type software should be easier to, for us to use. And it will be Tyler that as, as part of this service agreement will be converting us to the new software package. So it's it's nice to have it being the, the same company. Um, other than that, I, I, we do have the Tyler representatives here with us in case you have any real technical questions. Fortunately, we've got uh, Council Huddle back so he can answer any of your legal questions. And uh, I would just like you to consider the software package and approve it so we can get moving with our conversion and, and move on. I, one thing I would remind you, and I think I brought it up at the Budget Committee uh, last year, was that we did get a recommendation from our IT provider um, in favor of this Tyler software package. And one of the things they also mentioned to us was that our current system is, is past end of life. So uh, we are just squeaking by keeping it alive and hopefully we'll be able to keep it alive until after we do this conversion project. Well, I know you had a problem last year. It, cra evidently it crashed or it occasionally crashes, the one the current system you have. What I was wondering, if, if, could we get from you or either from Tyler um, just a brief summary of the, um, you know, the new bells and whistles or the changes in this that will help your office to expedite assessments and, and whatever else that you do? Well, I did cover some of that in the explanation uh, that is in, in your uh, packet. Um, but, Jill, would you mind giving a brief summary? Sure. Uh, not a problem. And, and uh, this is Gio Giordano, Senior Account Executive with Tyler Technologies. Uh, first off, thank you guys for giving me the time to, to join your meeting here. Um, just right off the bat, and I, and I heard a uh, reference to last year's issue, um, specifically that was a hardware where the backup tape um, failed and didn't allow the county uh, during a very special part of the uh, business process the opportunity to back up their, their data. Um, off the, right off the bat with Tyler hosting the software for the county that issue of hardware failing is non-existent. We are responsible and are essentially acting as if we are the county's IT department for the appraisal and taxation division. So any type of hardware issues are maintained, managed, and fixed by Tyler. So those issues or time crunches, scrambling, trying to figure out what the issue is with third-party vendors are eliminated. Tyler takes responsibility for that. So that's the first thing that I would say, um, you know, going to the service, uh, what we would, you know, what we provide to the county for going to the service. Now, from a functional standpoint, uh, Jim alluded to it being a more modern platform, and that's true. It is a Windows-based platform, web-based platform. Um, there are features and functionalities through workflow. Uh, business processes that will help the county become more efficient in their business process. So uh, being able to uh, manage the data, manage the, the uh, events or tasks that are taken on by the division are more um, accessible. There are uh, rights to roles, uh, excuse me, functionality built into the product, as well as a audit trail of all types of um, transactions that happen within the product, we manage and maintain all of uh, you know, where those changes take place, who makes those changes, state, uh, date, time, time as well. So there are plenty of other uh, functional enhancements that go above and beyond the current uh, legacy product that you're, you're, you're using, which we do maintain. Uh, and then, and lastly, Tim also alluded to the fact that we do currently maintain the 
legacy systems. So from a conversion standpoint, database standpoint, we're very familiar with the file layout structure. Um, this is not the first conversion from our legacy to Orion in the state of Oregon. Um, we've gotten uh, four implementations going already with another uh, two lined up. So we have experience um, in the state uh, with the new product as well. And so, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's a lot of other things we can go through, but, but those are just some of the things off the top of my head that I'd like to address. A uh, well, couple more things. Uh, this is a cloud-based system? That's correct. Okay. Well, I'm one of those people that I like to rely on the experts in their field to decide um, which software programs will best suit what they need. Um, so I'm sure that you've alerted this board many times as to your needs and your investigation on this. So I appreciate all the work. Commissioner Gold? Uh, I just have one question, uh, maybe two. Uh, in the counties that have used this, how long have they used it first? That's my okay, first yes, question. Uh, yes, not a problem. Thank you. Um, the first county to go live on Orion, the new, the new product that um, you guys are considering, uh, Multnomah County did two years ago. Um, Washington County as well. Uh, they went live last year on the appraisal stuff, and they went live on the tax portion of it this year. Um, we have two other counties slated to go live uh, this year with Lincoln County and then the very beginning of next year in Bill County and then Douglas County will begin their implementation there uh, at the end of this year. Okay. We have two currently live. Okay, so my second question is, as a result of using this software, were those counties, especially the ones, I guess Multnomah has been using it for two years and the other one for one year, were they able to increase their in efficiency in uh, doing the assessments by using your program? Uh, yes, yeah. uh, yeah, they, they were. Uh, there's probably areas that I'm un unaware of, but for example, one thing that I think really helps them is Orion is a tool that um, above and beyond just the valuation portion and tax billing collection portion, Orion allows you to bring in other aspects or other tools that are that are uh, necessary in that process and, and being a, able to bring in GIS mapping, for example, imagery from other sources, um, sketching tools, anything that the assessor or tax office would need to operate. Orion goes above and beyond just the valuation. It brings everything together. So there's one efficient operating system that they can use to do their job and not have to piece together different areas of, of function. So that would, I would say generally, that would probably be the first area of efficiency. Um, if we want to get into the business process, unfortunately, I couldn't speak to areas in their office that they need efficiencies, but I do know that they're all very happy um, and even uh, looking to expand in some, in some areas. So, Okay, so I guess bottom line is they're able to do things more quickly, thereby being able to, I, I guess you know our county is quite far behind, and I, I'm looking for efficiencies to, to get us moving ahead here. So that's why my question. Yeah, just from our own research and actually going to counties where they're using this product and the demonstrations that we've gotten, um, we can see that there's, I mean, to take it down to the very basics, we can see that there's fewer keystrokes involved in the work that we're going to need to do. So, that so there'll be more time for you guys to get out and assess. That's, to get more done, yeah. Yeah, that's my point, yeah. Okay. So we have to have public comment on the public hearing as well, right? Yes, if I could, Mr. Chair. Uh, Jim has spoken to the operative side of the contract, and so has uh, Mr. I think Giordano, Gio, and uh, Tyler. Why we're having a public hearing is because um, this was not done through sealed bids or um, sealed uh, or, right. or RFPs. But what Jim did is he essentially reviewed. There's essentially two vendors in this arena, um, and in so Oregon. in Oregon. Thank you. And so uh, G Jim uh, kind of compared them, and then basically. With the reasons that are in the packet, we 
publish those on the website. The other vendor know that we would have a public hearing today if they wanted to come and talk about, uh, you know, why they didn't think this was a good idea. And, um, so, and also the members of the public. And so that's what we're doing. This is a special procurement, and the public hearing is for that. And it's to show um, equal fairness uh, as if we would have done a sealed bid uh, type of thing. Okay. So at this time, I'm going to open public comment. Are there any public comments on this? Hearing none, public comments are now closed. We need a. We need to produce an order to approve this. So, um, when we get down to 14, right. if the board is so inclined, we can approve it under item 14. Okay. Or you could move that to now and do it now. So move, Mr. Chair. I'll second that. Further discussion. Mr. Chair, so the the motion is to give signature authority to the chair to approve this contract. Yes. Thank you. Uh, further discussion? Roll, please. Mr. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. <clears throat> thank you, and, and thank you, Gio and, Co and Paul, for uh, calling in. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Mr. Assessor. All right, next we have, uh, we're going to enter into executive session. So at this time, we're going to recess this meeting. It is 1114 and enter into executive session per 192-6602A uh, to consider the employment of a public officer, employee, staff member, or individual agent. 192-6602-D, to conduct deliberations with persons designated by the governing body to carry on labor negotiations. 192-6602-H, uh, uh, um, not subject to disclosure, and K for pending litigation. So with this meeting is in recess. When we come out of executive session, we will reconvene this meeting. 2020 coming out of executive session uh, staff is to uh, proceed as directed from executive session um, yes we do that's what I'm getting ready I'm just reading this sheet here um, our decisions on our labor negotiations currently are still are undecided we are still going to move forward with with those decisions uh, we're going to move on now to number 13 which are higher orders for an administrative secretary for the assessor's office, do I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the uh, hiring of the administrative assistant for the assessor's office. Second, Mr. Chair. Roll call, or, I'm sorry, further discussion? Roll, please. Major Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Yes. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. Next is a high order for a parks coordinator. I right. move that we hire the uh, parks coordinator that was um, came before us today. Second chair badge. Further discussion? Roll, please. Mr. Gold. Aye. Vice Chair Boyce. Aye. Chair Pash. Aye. Motion carried unanimously. On uh, other, we have um, on uh, other for 14, Tyler Technologies for Orient Assessment and Taxation Software and Service Agreement, uh, granting signature authority to the chair. We moved that up after the hearing. Oh, we did. Okay, that's already been done. All right. Well, I'm still on my list, so. <laughs> Do we have anything further? No. With nothing further, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>